Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about cerebral palsy, cerebral uh, pertaining to the brain and palsy as in paralysis. Now, cerebral palsy is an umbrella term that refers to a group of disorders affecting a person's ability to move. It is due to damage to the developing brain, either during the pregnancy or shortly just after birth. There's three important parts of the brain, uh, which is important to know uh, when dealing with cerebral palsy. And these three areas are the cortex, which is essentially the brain itself, the basal ganglia within the brain, and then the cerebellum. Cerebral palsy is a problem in one or more of these areas causing abnormal muscle tone, posture, and movement. The clinical presentation. Again, cerebral palsy is a disorder that manifests shortly after birth. Early signs of cerebral palsy include docitility, and irritability, poor feeding, abnormal reflexes, abnormal muscle tone, asymmetrical movement patterns. But of course, these signs can be missed and thought of as normal until the baby has grown. And that is why it is important to monitor for the delays in motor milestones. It is also important to know of the misconception that cerebral palsy gets worse as we age, when actually cerebral palsy is a static disorder and is non-progressive. Signs of cerebral palsy in childhood or cerebral palsy in general can be classified into three. Spastic syndrome, dyskinetic syndrome, or ataxic syndrome, not akinetic. Akinetic means no movement. What's interesting is that these syndromes correlate to the brain areas we talked about at the beginning of the video. The cerebrum, or cortex, the basal ganglia, and the cerebellum. Now, for spastic syndrome, this includes signs and symptoms such as tremors, hypertonicity, scissor gait, and limb weakness. The dyskinetic syndrome include abnormally slow movement, writhing movement, and this movement is exacerbated during stress or when there's no sleep. The ataxic syndrome involves the cerebellum, and so problems here causes a wide based gait and also intentional tremor. Cerebral palsy is not only about movement and motor problems. There are a lot of other complications associated with it. And these include pain, intellectual disability, speech and language disorders, epilepsy, seizures, visual impairment, bladder problems, sleep disorders, hearing impairment, hip displacement, and also behavioral problems. The diagnosis of cerebral palsy is clinical. However, an MRI of the brain can be performed if the cause of the signs and symptoms is unknown. The management of cerebral palsy involves a multidisciplinary team because there are a lot of complications as we talked about. The team involves a physiotherapy to help reduce impairment and optimize function, occupational therapist for self-care skills, and to increase independence. A speech therapist is here to, to, to assess for dysphagia and also to improve uh, communication. Orthopedic specialists is important to help with, uh, with mo the motor problems, with scoliosis of the spine, which is common, and to help with the use of various braces to help with movement. A neurologist, as well as a psychologist, is important for mental health. The general practitioner or family physician is probably the person who coordinates the whole thing. Then there's also the pediatrician and neurologist, as well as a pediatric nurse, if and when necessary. Let's talk about the mechanism of disease. So it's important to recap a little bit about neurology or neuroanatomy. So zooming into the brain here, here we have the cerebrum, the big matter of the brain. It connects to the brainstem, which then connects with the spinal cord, 
The cerebellum is an important structure that sits below the brain or cerebrum at the back. Let's now cut a cross section of the brain and we are looking at it from the front, so straight at it. In this brain section, we are looking at the motor cortex, the area of the cerebrum which helps initiate movement, specifically voluntary movement. So here is the right motor cortex and here is the left motor cortex. Neurons which arise from the right will travel down the spinal cord and send motor information to the left side of the body. Similarly, neurons arising from the left motor cortex will go down and cross over supplying the right side of the body. Let us now zoom into the left motor cortex. Here is the left motor cortex and we can also see the left cerebellum at the bottom here. Now the motor cortex has uh, designated areas uh, of, of our body. So for example, this area correlates with the lower limbs, this area, the upper limbs, and here the facial area. So if a neuron um, is arising from the upper limb area here on the left motor cortex, which is the area of the hand, it means that the neuron will supply motor to the hand on the right side. Because remember, it's supplying the opposite side of the body. This area is called the cortex, the brain cortex. It's more specifically the motor cortex, of course. And it's also part of the pyramidal group. It's part of the pyramidal group because uh, neurons that are involved here are voluntary. It's under conscious control. Here we have the basal ganglia and cerebellum, which actually communicates with the voluntary neurons to help send coordinated learned movement patterns. The basal ganglia and cerebellum is your extra pyramidal because they are not under conscious control. The types of cerebral palsy can be separated, as we mentioned, into areas affecting one or more of these regions. So for example, problems in the cortex causes spastic cerebral palsy. Problems in the basal ganglia causes dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Cerebellar problems causes ataxic cerebral palsy. And there's also mixed cerebral palsy, which is a mixture of one or more. Spastic cerebral palsy causes stiffness with difficulty um, moving the limbs. Spastic cerebral palsy is the most common type. Dyskinetic cerebral palsy affects the basal ganglia, producing involuntary and uncontrolled movement patterns which makes sense if you think about Parkinson's disease, which also affects the basal ganglia. Ataxic cerebral palsy affects the cerebellum and causes disturbance in the sense of balance. And this is why patients who have ataxic cerebral palsy have a wide gait. Then finally, there is the mixed cerebral palsy. While the cortex is part of the pyramidal group, the basal ganglia and cerebellum, as I mentioned, is not part of conscious control, and so it is the extra pyramidal group. Pyramidal cerebral palsy involves voluntary motor neurons. Extra pyramidal cerebral palsy involves involuntary motor neurons. Now problems in the cerebral cortex causes spastic cerebral palsy, and it is part of the pyramidal voluntary group whereas extrapyramidal cerebral palsy affects the cerebellum and or basal ganglia and is called ataxic or dyskinetic or athenoid cerebral palsy. Let us focus on spastic cerebral palsy first, which affects the cerebral cortex. Now, cerebral palsy is not only categorized as to the area of the brain affected, but also how much of the body um, is affected. So, for example, here the affected regions of the motor cortex is the left upper limb and the lower limb regions, which means that the right upper limb and the right lower limb are affected. Therefore, this person will have stiff limbs on the right side. And there's also increased tone here as well. Because half of the body on one side is affected, this is called 
hemiplegia. Similarly, in this example, the affected area is bilaterally the lower limbs of the motor cortex, which means that the lower limbs of the person will be stiff and also have increased tone. When the muscles in the lower limb are stiff, increased tone, different muscles work more than others, and a characteristic feature of spastic cerebral palsy is the scissor gait. Because the lower half of the body is affected, this is also called paraplegia or diplegia. Other parts of the limbs can also be partially affected in spastic cerebral palsy. Finally, there's quadriplegia. This is bilateral upper and lower limb motor cortex involvement. There is also scissor stance with all limbs stiff. So that was pyramidal cerebral palsy, also known as spastic cerebral palsy, which affects the cerebral cortex. Now let's focus on the extra pyramidal cerebral palsy. And here, all the body is affected. There is no hemiplegia, there's no diplegia, there's no quadriplegia, everything is affected. In ataxic cerebral palsy, the cerebellum is the problem. The cerebellum is a very important structure in the brain for balance and coordination. And so if this is affected, there is balance and coordination difficulty. As a result, the person will have a wide gait. In dyskinetic cerebral palsy, the basal ganglia is involved, creating uncontrolled movement and dystonia. So what causes cerebral palsy? Well, there is no exact cause, but there is thought that a number of things can or could have a relationship to cerebral palsy. And these include perinatal hypoxic ischemic injury, prematurity, which is seen in the majority of cerebral palsy patients, antepartum hemorrhage during pregnancy, and intrauterine infections as well, intracranial hemorrhage in the fetus or fetal stroke, a risk is if a mother has multiple pregnancies, and there's also possibly genetic susceptibility. It's interesting to note that the majority, 80% of cerebral palsy are due to perinatal or antenatal factors, and only uh, less than 20 are actually acquired after the neonatal period. So that was from me, but check out a great video on cerebral palsy by the osmosis team. They go into a bit more detail on the pathophysiology behind cerebral palsy as well as the causes.